In this episode, I'm going to be interviewing Bigami Initimi. Now, Bigami Initimi is a Nigerian who traveled from Nigeria to England for his master's degree. After his master's degree, he was able to do some remarkable things that I know you guys will be interested, particularly those of you who are watching my content from England or from other parts of the world. So he was able to become a European citizen. Now what this means is he was able to become a citizen of a European member country. He was able to buy a house in England and he was able to land his dream job that paid very handsomely. Okay, so if you're interested in catching this interview as it drops, you might want to go down. You might want to, this might be that one time when you might want to go down and touch your torment, smash that subscribe button, and while you're down there, turn on that bell icon because it keeps you notified when we drop new content in the future. And now you're here, well, come on, do your boy a favor. Give us a thumbs up. It helps us a lot. It tells the YouTube algorithm that you found this content very valuable and you're going to find more people just like yourself to show this video to. So give me one second. I'm going to dash off to the market. In that time, I want you to get your pen ready, get your pad, and I'm going to be right back with more. You know the way I do it when I drop lyrical Anytime I spit lyrical, philosophical All the niggas mimical, but they stare still On ticket literal, punch lines, collateral So guys, I'm speaking with Bigami Inetimi um, Bigami Inetimi is a Nigerian who traveled to England to bag his master's degree but he's been able to accomplish what most Nigerians and what most international students have been unable to do. He's been unable to become a European citizen and he's been, he's been able to buy his own house. In addition to that, he's been able to land a job that pays him, and let me just put it, something comfortable. Okay, let me not blow it out of proportion, but it pays him really, really well. So in this interview, we're going to hear about his journey from Nigeria to the UK and all the challenges he faced along the way, how he was able to solve them. And it's my hope that you're going to use his story as an inspiration to help yourself if you do find yourself studying in the UK or looking to get your papers sorted out while in the UK. So Walker, how's it going, bruv? Okay, so everything is fine. Um, I'm I'm honored that you um you, you asked me to get on on the interview. Yeah, so it's all good. It's all good. Nice to have this chat with you. Nice one, nice one. So, Walker, where are you at the moment? Um, I'm currently living in a city called Nottingham. I'm sure a lot of people know it. It's in the East Midlands in the UK in England. Um, okay. Yeah, close to it's close to Leicester. If, if okay. people are familiar with the UK, yeah. Okay, I'm sure our viewers are familiar with the UK because a lot of people watch the EPL, so I'm sure they must have heard Leicester in the EPL. So what are you doing in Nottingham? Are you studying or are you working? Um, currently, I'm working, um, working for the Open University. So I'm currently working as a coordinator for their policy um, and um, accredita accreditation um, department. So it's more about... Um, accreditations, um, qualifications, and, and assessments. So we basically had help set up um, more like the quality assurance aspects of examinations at the university. So we get external examiners, um, that's professionals, maybe doctors or professors or people that are well-known or that have a good understanding of their fields to look into the examinations that we have or different assessments that we have to, to make sure that it's on the same level um, with the universities in the UK. So I work on that. So we have assessment boards that meet for, for each period that their examinations. Um, and also we ensure that we have the right people in these positions to sit at the meeting with our, um, with our lecturers and academics as well. So gotcha, there's gotcha. The, that, yeah, that, that's a major thing there. And, yeah, it has also to do with one of the biggest part is just that quality assurance at the university, if I'm going to summarize it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, Walker, we're going to come back to you, whatever it is you're doing right now. You're going to 
have the opportunity to tell us how you landed this position. But right now, let's just cover the groundwork first, then we'll come back to this question, okay? Okay. <clears throat> now, did you travel to work or did you travel to study? What was the purpose of your traveling or leaving Nigeria in the first place? Oh, yeah. So the initial goal was to get a master's degree. So I, I traveled to study. Okay. And what was your major? What, what degree did you travel to study? Yeah, it's a long one. Um, it's, it's, I, I traveled to do a master's degree in petroleum and environmental technology. So it has both petroleum aspects and also environmental aspects as well. So, um, yeah, so that, that's a short, <laughs> short answer. Gotcha, gotcha. And it must have been very expensive traveling to the UK to study. Do you know how much it costs you? I'm talking about in total, both tuition fee, cost of leaving, and all, all the package together. How much did it cost you to bag or to secure your master's degree? So, yeah, so basically the tuition is about around a thousand pounds. Yeah, between eleven to a thousand to to twelve thousand pounds rather. Okay, eleven, 11 to twelve thousand pounds. Gotcha. Pounds, yeah, okay. probably with any other additional cost that might be on the academic aspect. Then, with for for housing, you might be thinking about like four hundred to to five hundred or more um, per month. I yeah, I think my, looking at my house rent, it was probably around five hundred and fifty. Okay. But I had I had that split with with housemates. And okay. uh, yeah, that's another cost. So over the year, so you can do the math. So that must be, um, that's 5,000, 6,000, probably 7,000, an additional 7,000 or more okay. for the housing. That's and true. then you, you have food <laughs> and things like that. Mm -hmm. Then mm -hmm. the cost mm -hmm. of the ticket as well, which is also like $1,000 um, just well, when you mean ticket, you mean airfare, yeah, yeah, yeah. The flight tickets it was, gotcha. and also that depends on how early you, or late you book as well. So that could affect the price of the ticket. So if you know okay. that you're going early enough, then it would be wise to book early gotcha. enough. So, yeah, so yeah, that those those are the major costs: though. flights, yeah, the tuition, accommodation, and of course you have to eat as well. So gotcha. yeah. Gotcha. And were you self-sponsored or were you sponsored by your parents? Okay, so uh, neither actually. Um, no? I, I got yeah, I got a scholarship from um, the NDDC. So it's it's um, the Niger Delta, um, I think, Development Commission or something. I now I've forgotten their name. It's been too long. <laughs> it's been a long time. So I, so I got a scholarship from them. I was fortunate enough to get that, and um, they paid fully for my tuition. And also my my upkeep in the UK, but initially, um, the way it works is that you would have to you would have to fly there, you'd have to arrange your flight because it takes a while for for the for the for the board to actually put the payments in in place. So and also I think they just want you to show evidence that you're really going to study, and you're really enthusiastic to study, and not just someone that is going to go there to play around. Because they're going to give you the they're going to give you the money, <laughs> but you have okay. to be studying first. Because I before I even got the funds, I was I probably was there for about a month or two months before the money finally came in for the tuition. Uh, gotcha. So so that took a while though. So I, I had to pay I had to I had to pay um, my way. I think around the first um, first month. Months. Yeah. Uh, and how did you find out? Because many people want to go abroad to study, but the problem is the cost and how expensive it is. How did you find out about the NDDC scholarship? How did you get to hear about this stuff? I think at a point in time, um, I think I was just constantly looking for the, this kind of opportunities. I think I've even, I had already even, even looked and probably written some, some, scholarship test before but i was always hungry and on the lookout for the next thing on different online. Black, yeah were you online. Looking online yeah i was uh, looking online gotcha. mostly it's it's we're we're in, in the internet age so everything mm -hmm. is online usually you might find in the newspaper sometimes they do advertise in the newspaper but mostly it's online on job forum and student forum there are also scholarship forums as well um and websites as well so looking everywhere and um found that NDC scholarship, especially because it was relating to me. 
mm-hmm. as well as someone from from the Niger Delta. So it it's something that I knew that would probably work out. And I'd already tried before and kept on looking out for the next opportunity. So yeah, so I think basically it was just the search, like continuously searching for for it and, and looking out for the next opportunity that came out and finally went through the process and it worked out somehow. And when you got the notification from the board of the NDC or whoever's in charge of sending out notifications to successful candidates, what documentation were you required to submit? What documentation did you have to present to them before you got awarded the scholarship or before the aptitude test? Okay, so, um, yeah, so I think usually they ask for your local government, um, yeah, I, um, I think identification certificates and letter. And also, of course, you also need your, 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 your bachelor's degree or, or whatever certificate you've gotten from your university. Um, definitely, they ask for also references, especially at the stage where they're going to award you the letter. So I was fortunate that I had, that I had some good lecturers that I could go over to and they were happy to write a reference letter for me. Also, I had to write, get a reference letter crazy enough from my um, local government council again like from, I think from the counselors there at the local government level, had to speak with them. They wrote a letter for me as well. Um, what else? I think these were the basic things when, yeah. Yeah, there, when I finally got it, yeah. Got you, got you. And you were awarded the scholarship to go to the UK, particularly England to study. You could have chosen any country. You could have gone to America. You could have gone to Australia. Why did you decide to go to the United Kingdom? What was your reason? Um, I, I think, first of all, I, it was because I believe that for my qualification specifically, um, the UK was, was more well known for, for the work they did and the universities there. So it had to do with the qualification and making sure that I got something good out of it. Um, I could have gone to the to the U.S. Yeah, but I think in terms of the value of the qualification, I felt the U.K. was better. Additionally, I also thought about the economics, the economic side of it. Of course, we're Nigerians. We think about that. Like if you look at the value of the pound, it's usually a lot higher than that of the U- of of the dollar. So I felt it was a it was a better opportunity, even money wise, <laughs> if you compare the salaries mm-hmm, that mm-hmm, you would earn mm-hmm. and if, when you convert it to naira as well. So that was another factor. I think these two main things, yeah. Man is thinking about the mula, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, of course. You think about the, the, the funds as well at the end mm-hmm. of the day. But was this, was this out in your first time in Europe? Was this the first time you were traveling also out of the shores of Nigeria or had you traveled out of Nigeria before? Oh uh, No, that was, it wasn't the first time. I had spent, um, I had spent a, a year or two um, in the east of Europe, in Turkey, um, on an internship. So um, from an organization called ISEC, which basically helps um, young people and students develop a career. So so they they, they do trainings and, and um, internships. So I was able to do that. And it was a fun experience, yeah, meeting people from around the world and having that um, international exposure. Gotcha. Now, between England and Turkey... Which of these two countries do you think has a better standard of living compared if you had to compare the two or put the two on the same pedestal? Which offers people or which offered you, in your opinion, a better standard of living? Um, truth of the matter is that's a very difficult question. Not in the sense that England is more, of course, is more is more Western in the in the sense that when we compare it to um, what we see in American movies or, or, or in British movies, like it's what we can relate to more, like the, the, um, the food, the environment, the nightclubs, it's cool. And, the, and in terms of, of, I always go back to economics and in terms of, of how much you get paid, it's a lot better financially, it's a financial, financially um, more viable option um, so that's one thing about the UK. So standard of living, yes, you can say it's a little bit better. But the, with, with Turkey, it's more about 
the environment and how it looks. So Turkey, at least the cities I've been to, like these cities are more touristic. Like you have a beach next to you, you have sun, you have a lot of people around, usually from different parts of the world because they're coming there to enjoy themselves with that kind of touristic, um, sit, those kind of touristic cities. Um, you have amazing, uh, amazing nightclubs, um, places that, that look just incredible to be in. Like the environment is amazing. The weather is amazing as well um, when you compare that to the UK. But the only thing in all this, all that glitters is not gold and all this greatness, if you compare the, the financial system or you compare the standard of living, it might not be um, equivalent to that of the UK. So that's something else. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful place to be in. Mm -hmm. But it's not as um, financially secured or the, the their economic system is not as good as it is in the UK. Got you. Got you. And you said you are in Nottingham, yeah? yeah. Was this the city you traveled to Nigeria to go to when you were leaving Nigeria? Did you travel from Nigeria to Nottingham? Um, so initially, um, I when I came to the UK, I... I I lived in Coventry. I actually went to the um, Coventry University. So that was that was not act the actual city that I I um I started living in. So I've been around different places, but yeah, start started in Coventry before I moved over to 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 Nottingham. Gotcha. And many people say Coventry is almost like Lagos. Many people say because of the population of black people in Coventry, it feels like they're back in Lagos. Is this even true? No, as in, I wouldn't disagree that there are a lot of Nigerians or a lot of black people in Coventry. But again, I, I think it's just about your what you make of the experience. Um, the truth of the matter is that I, we have a lot of people from different places. We have Chinese, Indian students, students from different places, from Ireland and so on. And also, yeah, I met I met some students from Lithuania, Lithuania, and some other places as well. There are students from different places, but the problem that I, I always see is that students actually tend to gravitate towards their own ethnic groups. Nigerians are moving with Nigerians, Chinese students are moving with Chinese students. That's a lot of it's always with these two major ethnic groups, <laughs> yeah, and mm. also some Indians as well that come together. So, but I think that. My point is that the experience is what you make of it. I myself, I, I've always tried to create a more, especially if I travel abroad, I always try to get into the experience of that city or that country. So I try to mix up with people. I, I was involved in a lot of activities with our student union. I actually worked at the student union. So I got to meet people around the campus that were not just Nigerians from different parts of the the world. My friends themselves were not just Nigerians. I had friends from India, from Dubai, from the UK, from from different parts of the world as well. So I think my point is that if people say that it's like Lagos, I think it's because they make it like Lagos. They decide to spend yes. all their time, all their time with their fellow Nigerians, eat Nigerian food. I think if you travel abroad, you should try to kind of integrate with the society try to get a different experience so if you go over to coventry and want to have a nigerian experience you will have a nigerian experience but if gotcha. you feel that you want to have an international experience then you will have an international experience gotcha and what about the locals so you you're going out to town to do your shopping for your clothes for your food or you're going out to the club or you're going out to the bank what are the locals like are they friendly at the antagonistic what are they like no, I think generally, the, from my experience, uh, I don't. I wouldn't say what other people have experienced. But my experience, the locals are pretty friendly, and they they tend they don't tend to be too antagonistic. Antagonistic because it, it's the UK. Usually, people are people are have a friendly demeanor. Like even the way they speak, it's also friendly. Of course, um, also like any other place on earth, you might still have people that are a little bit antagonistic, as you said, or a little bit unfriendly. But generally, everyone I, I saw, most people I saw, or most people I related with, or didn't know and just spoke to were, were friendly. They're, I don't think 
it was that crazy. But I would not dispute if someone said they had some kind of crazy experience because that's part of the world. We still live in the world today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Gotcha. And what would you say is the biggest, what, what would you say is the biggest misconception most people, what do you think is the biggest misconception most people have when they travel to the UK or when they travel to Europe or when they travel to England? What is the biggest misconception? What, what would you say would this be? I think one of the biggest misconceptions is, is the fact that people think that they cannot um, actually make something out of their stay in the UK. When I say make something, I mean like get a, a job that's reasonable, that is something that you can still pride yourself on and it's not something that has to be manual labor. Um, the reason why I said this is that a lot of, a lot of my classmates were all, mostly working in factories or working in some jobs that were mostly manual and probably uncomfortable. And me, right, as in, right from the beginning, I just, I knew that I'm like, I'm there for a master's degree. I know my qualifications and what my experience so I always try to, to get something that was way beyond that. So even, for example, working at a student union, that's not a factory job. So I think that one big misconception is that people say, oh, there is no job in the UK and the British people will not employ you. That's a big lie. If you have the skills and if you open your eyes to the opportunities, you will actually get them. So I think that's a big misconception people have. Gotcha. And while you were studying in the UK, while you were studying in England, were you working at the same time? Oh, yeah. As, as I said before, I was working not at the beginning. I wasn't working like around six to eight months. I was just focused on studies. Um, but eventually I decided I'll start working, even though I had a scholarship. So I first job was my first job was at a student union. Um, then before I got a job, a second job, which was more full time. Um, at a company called Seven Trends, which was more into environmental, the environmental area in water and waste water technology and treatment. So, yeah, I was working, but much later in my studies, into my studies. Wow. Wow. So you work with a student union, then you got a job with Seven Trends. Now, how did you go about, because I know, trust me, I've been there international student coming to the UK, the last thing you ever think is getting involved in student union politics. How did you get around the challenges and the difficulties and getting into politics on campus? Oh, no. So the, the, I, I don't want there to be a misconception. So I wasn't involved in politics. I was involved in actual student union um, administration and logistics and things like that. So it wasn't politics. But the truth of the matter is that that's another way that students could go. You could get involved in the politics and you could make it if you are charismatic enough to um, to garner people's votes because it's all about votes, it's politics. Mm -hmm. But I was not involved in, in any politics. I was more involved because Student Union is an organization like a company. So you mm -hmm. can actually work there in terms of administrative work, in terms of organizing, in terms of logistics, mm -hmm. HR, different things like that. So it's an actual organization, like a company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So I was working. I was working in the organizational aspect, not the politics. Uh, not, <laughs> not the not politics. The, gotcha. Gotcha. Politics, gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Thanks for clearing that up, man. Now, what about the job with Seven Trend? Now, Seven. It sounded. The job sounds kind of a little bit technical. It sounds like it's a very technical job. How were you able to land such a job when you finish your master's program? Uh, so basically. Um, yeah, so my master's degree was more relate was related to to that specific job. So um, it, it's in petroleum and environmental technology, and part of that, part of some of the modules that we did had to do with water and wastewater treatment technology and some new innovations in that area. So um, definitely, I looked for different jobs like that, and finally. Um, Applied, applied very <laughs> sporadically or continuously to different organizations. But Seven Trend was somewhere I really want, wanted to work with in because I even had a lecturer that spoke, that worked there as well. So I knew that, oh, that might be a good place to pursue a career in. So yeah, I applied for it and as I did apply for a lot of other positions and somehow got it at the end of the day. Got you. So just like you found this scholarship, you went to a line and you researched for all these companies and you applied to all of them and this one kind of stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course. Yeah. Got you. Got you. Got you. At the start of this video, you told me about your current position. So I take it you're done with uni. Yeah. 
Yeah, of course. The choice of your job selection, was it dependent on your major? Did the major you were studying in, did it have any influence at all in your job selection process? I wanted to work for this company because I studied this course. Was there any relation, was there any correlation between the two? Yeah, there was, there was a big correlation um, because during, during my studies, um, I, I had a lecturer who actually said he worked for that company. And we, we did a lot of, um, we, we had a module and projects on water and what, um, wastewater treatment technology. So I was, I was interested in working for that company. And I've, I'd been applying for different positions, as I said, and finally got the opportunity. So I was really happy that I had the opportunity to work for the company. Yeah, so it did have a big, uh, my qualification actually had a big um, impact on, on, on getting that job itself. Okay. And you said earlier, the start of um, this conversation, you said that you work for the Open University. Can you throw more light on your job with the Open University or whatever it is you're doing right now? Um, so basically, as I, as I said earlier on, so the job is more of a, um, more, it has more to do with, with the qualification and assessments and, and, and credits um, part of, of the Open University. So we okay. we're involved in ensuring the quality of of the of their assessment process, examinations, projects, thesis, and things like that. So basically, we have external examiners um, who we we get to to chair boards, and we try to organize these board meetings between them and and academics at the university. So we have we do organize that. So that's part of my role. Um, to go through getting the external examiners, making sure they, they can be on the board. And also the role has to do with, with policy advice as well, making sure that everything that is done is, um, goes through um, the policy of the university. Um, gotcha. So it has to do with coordination between academics and also managers at different policy centers. And also um, it has to do with with um, just making sure that the process is, is followed, if I can summarize it in a short way, but there are different aspects of it. Well, my job is major, majorly coordination of, of these processes, um, of, of, um, of making sure the quality of the exam, the exams and assessments that we do are um, at the same level with, or even greater than, than other universities in the UK. Gotcha. And I take it you're working on a full-time basis, yeah? Yeah, full-time, permanent basis. Gotcha. And how were you able to do this? Because I know it's very difficult. Are you, were you using a graduate route visa? Did you have to change your visa status? How were you able to finish uni and get a job on a full-time basis without having to worry <laughs> about duration of stay, the amount of time you have to stay back in the UK for and all what not? Um, definitely that, that was a long, kind of a long journey, but there are different route, routes that I could have taken. Um, so th at, the, at this point in time, I have a full stay and uh, residency in the UK. So oh. that, yeah, that allows me to, of course, get a job which is permanent or get a job um, that I can be there on, on a long time basis. So um yeah, so I think, yeah, there are different ways that you can actually do that, which I think you might be aware of, like they have graduate programs and either you could also be employed by um, an employee that has um, the right to give you a work permit and not every employer has that right. So I believe that if you're looking for um, an employer, then it should be someone that has that that has that certificate you, you we actually have you actually in the uk you have employers that have a certificate where they can actually give you work permits so that's one thing you should look for but at this point the um the reason why i can get this job or the reason why i can work on a long time basis is because i do have residency in the uk right now okay and i know a lot of viewers are waiting and they've been probably saying why are you delaying, sir? What is the problem? How did you do it? How did you get your Euro, Euro citizenship? How did you go around this particular thing that most people are trying to do, particularly Blacks and Africans, and been unable to do to this point? How were you able to hold this down? 
Okay, so long, it's a really long story. <laughs> so basically, I did stay in the UK, but, um, but of course, I moved around a little bit in, in Europe and, and eventually I got married. <laughs> yeah. And okay. I think when, when you do get married, you, that's status. I, I, do, I did get married to a European citizen. That status moves on to you. So, um, and also, I do have European citizenship right now because of that, but it takes a while for that to happen. But I was very persistent. I did move around in the UK, in, in, in Europe um, a lot and did get married to someone that was a European citizen. So that transferred and that is how I was able to actually get um, the UK residency. Uh, got you. And while you were, because I know it's not, it's not as easy as that. So it's not as easy as just getting married to someone who is from Europe or who's from a European country and automatically just become a Euro citizen. What were the documentation you had to file? Were you filing it by yourself? Did you get an agent to do it on your behest? How did you go about this? Um, so first of all, so in terms of, of filing documents, I've never been one to get an agent or a lawyer to do that for me. But with every single thing that I've done, I've actually done it myself, um, right from applying for, for visas all the way in Nigeria to applying for um, residency in the UK or any other country. So um, I think it's just all about reading the document. There could be lots, lots, a lot to read and lots to be careful about, but you just have to look at it carefully. So um, I've always applied for things by myself, but yeah, in terms of documents that you have to provide, as you know, it's, it's not just about, yeah, just automatically it happens. Of course you have to, maybe if you're getting married or you definitely have to provide documents to show that you are still a bachelor. Um, you'd need your birth certificates. You'd need, um, a letter from, um, this is the ministry of internal affairs as well. Um, so these documents, you might need to get them back <laughs> from Nigeria or something like that. And, and that, that, that could be a big challenge. You were telling me about the documentation required to file for your citizenship of the Eurozone. Can you please expatiate on that? Um, yeah, like, uh, yeah. So, of course, it's not just direct. Like, you, you do have to um, show that you've that you, you, you were not previously married. So you, you, have to, you have to have a document from, the, from Nigeria to show that you are a bachelor. Um, you have to get your birth certificates. Um, you'd have to get, um, I think also a document from the Ministry of Internal Affairs as well in Nigeria. Um, um, what other documents again? So I think these are the major documents that you would have to, to get this, um, just to do this and it could sometimes be really tricky especially if you're abroad already and you don't have these documents so you might have to call someone over <laughs> or someone to send it over or have to get back to Nigeria to to get that yeah so yeah and also uh, another thing is this um, when people think about maybe being married to maybe someone from Europe or anywhere else I, I think with certain countries, especially in Europe and, and, and the UK, before they usually think about residency or, or things like that, you would have to, especially with the UK, you would have to all prove that you've been with this person for a period of time for about three years or so. Or, or so. And it's, yeah, so it's, they just want to ensure that, of course, it's not a scam. It's something that's mm -hmm. real that you have a real relationship. They even ask questions like, where did you meet? When did you meet? <laughs> and you have, to show, you have to show evidence of your relationship with this person. So they try to minimize that, those kind of things. So yeah, so it's, yeah, there's some documents that you would have to show. These are the basic things. With, with the UK, they ask for some extra documents, like just to show your relationship as well. So gotcha, gotcha. I, I know that. Um, what is the? I know you pay rent. What is the rent like in Nottingham? What is the rent situation? How much rent do you pay? What is your rent agreement like with your landlord? So currently, I don't pay rent. Um, and oh, I don't, I don't have a landlord per se. Yeah. Oh, so, how? How? Well, can you explain on that? Can you explain on that? Um, because I currently have my own place. And you own your house? Yes, I own my own how, place. So dude, I, how did you manage that, man? Um, so, of course, with, um, with living in, 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 in Western countries, there are facilities uh, for that. Like, it's a lot, 
easier. There's, there's some facilities that, that you have in, in Europe and in the West that it's not really open um, to people in, back in Nigeria. So, of course, you have the mortgage system where you could actually have a down payment of like maybe 10 to 20,000 and then pay up the rest gradually. So those facilities are open. And also this, this might require you to prove that, of course, you can pay for that. Maybe if you have a permanent job or some form of business that would actually prove that you can actually make these payments. So, so that, that's basically how, um, I, that was basically how I was able to do that, yeah. Uh, didn't the whole credit rating and credit system come into play? Wasn't that like a challenge or a sticking point in whether you could own a house or not? Didn't they tell you your credit rating was not up to and stuff like this? Oh, yeah. No, so that's, that's, that's also a point to look at as well. But um, the fact that we as foreigners, uh, we don't really... Um, we don't really get into this credit thing or, or buying things on credit and stuff like that. So I think that really helps us to reduce maybe the possibility of having bad credit rating as well. So I, I think that that really helps. We're not really into credit. We're into buying things directly. So <laughs> if we can take advantage of, if we can take advantage of the system of credits for actually buying property, then I think that's, that is the best thing we can do rather than mm -hmm. having credits for maybe um, a car or a phone or some expensive thing that you just, that's probably going to go away. But I think when it's a house and that's more important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And do you think the process you went through to own your house, do you think it's something any immigrant coming, whether from Africa, coming, whether from another part of Europe or whether from America, do you think it's something from Asia? Do you think it's something anybody can do? Was the process so daunting for you or is something that anybody can just take up and move to the finish line and get to own their own houses? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think it's something anyone can do. Um, but, but there are just some... There's some requirements, like, of course, you have to be able to show that you've been there for a number of years. And either you have um, also what helps also is like if you're if you have a permanent residence. But if you can show that you're going to be there for the long term. Yeah. And you've been there for at least three to, to five years, then that also helps. If you go initially, then it's not something that can go straight away, except if you can prove that you have the funds or you can buy it directly, which I think that's not the case for most people. But I think it's something that anyone that is, I think is anyone is something that anyone can do. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. And I, I see it in the news, a lot of refugees moving into Poland, a lot of refugees moving into England and all the neighboring countries that border Ukraine. Now, how has the war between Russia and Ukraine affected the standard of living? I mean, economically in England, has this affected the way you live or how you buy or the, the cost of things you buy in, in terms of groceries? Not that I've noticed. I've not noticed any real change in cost of anything, in my opinion. Um, everything is still the same in terms of movement. I think everything is still the same through Europe. Um, you can travel anywhere you want to. Um, the only thing that might be, that might have been really affected is just the price of gas, of diesel and fuel, because of course, I think Russia is a major exporter of this through Europe, or to Europe rather. So that's the major thing that has been affected. But I may have not noticed any real big change in, in the price of, of everyday items. Yeah, so but I don't think that's really changed or the way that we live has really changed. The only thing that has really changed is the cost of, of fuel. Gotcha. Now, now, do you have any advice for people looking to travel to the UK to study, to work or to live? Do you have anything that you might want to tell these people to keep in mind while they're making their trip over? Okay, specifically for the UK, I would say have a plan before you come yeah so if you want to stay then you need to have a plan of how are you going to do that and start working on the on that plan immediately when you when you get here so for me personally there were there are some things i wish i had done like at the beginning yeah so have a plan when you come through 
um, if you want to stay, then know how exactly you want to stay, what routes you want to get through and start working at it, on it right from the beginning because um, time is of the essence. So if you're a student, of course, you have a student visa and that's going to end soon. So you need to have a plan from the beginning. Of course, study, study hard, try to get your degree, but have a good plan of maybe if you want to work. And another thing is this, a lot of people... Um, think about that they're they always say that there, maybe there's no job or maybe they need some experience. I would also say um, even before you finish, just like I did, try to get some, try to get some jobs in the UK that would show that you have UK experience as well. So you might need to start from agencies or maybe at, from your student university, your student union or something like that, get some jobs within the UK that gives you some experience and they can see that on your CV as well. So start with agencies and build that until maybe you get a permanent job in the UK. Um, and another big advice is look for companies that actually have allowance for work permits and do that very early on. So I think that's a big thing, like plan early, take action and yeah, start gradually with either way, with get some experience. Yeah. But start early. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Thanks so much, bro. Now, guys, today we were speaking with Bigami Initimi. Bigami Initimi is a Nigerian who left Nigeria to go study for his master's degree in England and was able to not just buy a house, but to able to get all the documents through that saw him become a citizen of Europe. So he became a citizen of Europe bought a house in England and is working a job that is paying him very handsomely. Okay. Bruv, I really appreciate you today for sharing your experience with me and with the rest of my viewers today. Okay. Thank you very much. So there you have it guys. If you're planning to travel to the UK, particularly England from Nigeria or from any other country in the world to study, to work, and then to stay. You now know what to do. You now know how to apply for jobs, the type of jobs that you can apply for. The sky is the limit for you. Don't put a ceiling over your head as to what you can accomplish. You can accomplish anything you set your mind out to accomplish. Just like Bigami did, traveling from Nigeria to England, becoming a European citizen, owning a house, and working for his dream company. So this could also be your story. Don't leave your country planning to go to England and think you're going to be a second-hand citizen there. You're not going to have the rights of citizens there. You can accomplish whatever you set out to accomplish. It's just all up to you, okay? So if this video was valuable to you, why don't you go down, smash the subscribe button, okay? Come on, we're bringing valuable content to you. The least you can do is subscribe and become part of the fam, okay? And while you're down there, Turn on the bell icon so you can stay notified when we drop new content going forward. And if you love this video and you felt this video is valuable to you, why don't you give us a thumbs up? It helps us a lot. It tells the YouTube algorithm that the videos we put out were valuable to you. And you're going to find people just like you all around the world and show these videos too. And if you have family members or friends who are already currently studying in the UK, in England, or planning to go to England to study, you might want to share this video with them so that they stay guided on your decision-making process. And like I always say, happiness is a choice. It's your choice to be happy. It's not the place of your mom, your dad, your brother, your sister, your husband, your wife, your girlfriend, or your boyfriend to make you happy. It's your place to make yourself happy. So choose to be happy today and have an awesome week ahead. I still remain your boy Fuse on the Fuse Chronicles. I'll catch you on the next cut. Bye-bye for now.